Um, as Vicky said, we're going to be talking today, or I'm going to be talking today, about uh, migration uh, from ISC DHCP to Kia. Um, one of the things though, that I'm going to talk about before I actually get down to the mechanism of doing that is the considerations that you might need to go through before you actually go into a migration. Uh, because I've, I've dealt with this a bunch in the past with a number of different uh, organizations that I've been a part of. And everybody says, oh, we're going to migrate. And then suddenly they realize what they've actually stepped into. So with that, let me give you a little bit of information about myself. Um, I've worked uh, in a number of places uh, during the last 25 or 30 years uh, on internet facing, uh, internet related things, most of them uh, having to do with DNS, uh, specifically ISC's BIND, uh, and of course DHCP. Uh, I've worked in university and uh, internet service provider environments, uh, and when I say ISP, I use the the, the more generalized term, I've worked for a service provider and a hosting provider and all those other things. Um, I've also worked at ISC for uh, quite a few years uh, in various times uh, during, during the past. And I've also worked at multiple IPAM appliance vendors. And the time that I spent at those IPAM appliance vendors really opened my eyes as to some of the issues that, that do come up during uh, during migrations and during the, the planning and the preparation for those migrations. I'm going to provide you some uh, observations from my experience. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you have, uh, you know, walked around and, and done uh, uh, different, uh, worked for different vendors or different companies uh, over the years and seen how things have occurred. But I've had a really interesting vantage point uh, kind of from above and seeing into multiple uh, organizations, uh, the problems and the, the practices that they ended up with uh, during migrations. First of all, migrations are hard. Um, that's, that's not to be understated at all. Uh, when you start doing, when you start working on the migration, often you'll just say, oh, you know, well, we're just moving our, our DHCP servers from, uh, from this one, one server over here to that one server over there, really running the same code, no big deal. And then you run into all of the little things that, uh, that, are, that are kind of, you know, a pain. Um, migrations are not always wanted or needed. And the issue about being wanted, um, one of the things that happens a lot during a migration or during, during a phasing in of new software is the phasing out of old software or possibly the merging of uh, technologies. Um, in the past, I've worked with organizations that were running, for example, a large Microsoft uh, infrastructure with a little bit of uh, ISC DHCP sitting around, and they were moving to a uh, platform where it was almost all um, either an appliance or they were moving to a, an ISC DHCP uh, underpinning. And a lot of times, there's a lot of kickback from the people who feel that their uh, job or their work is being taken away from them. So one of the things that you really, really need to be aware of is you need to communicate a lot with everybody that's involved. Um, some of those people are not gonna want to migrate. Sometimes the need to migrate is actually questionable, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So with a migration, first of all, what are the benefits of doing a migration? And well, obviously, you know, you're moving a new code or you're moving a new hardware or, you know, whatever, but there are also some kind of unexpected benefits. And one of them comes from the fact that there's almost always something that you don't know about your network. Uh, I worked with uh, a, a number of organizations, you know, and, and they were getting ready to do uh, migration from uh, you know, from existing onto a new platform, and everything was planned out, everything was working very, you know, everybody had worked very hard on this, very diligent work, and the day of the cutover came, and when the cutover occurred, it was very surprising that it didn't go smoothly, because there were pieces of the network that nobody was aware of. They weren't realized, they didn't realize you know, I was obviously an outsider, but people inside the company, inside the organization, didn't know that there were all of these little pieces that were using 
infrastructure that they may not even have been aware existed until the day of the cutover. So there's always something that you don't know about that network. And there's always something that you don't understand about your DHCP configuration. Having looked at a lot of DHCP configurations over the years, I'll tell you that, that there are bits in there, you know, you're comparing, you know, why are we looking at this specific vendor option? You know, why are, why are we returning this to that specific class? And when that occurs, you know, it's best left alone. Well, it's, it's working now, so, you know, we'll just, we'll just leave it that way. Well, if you're moving, if you're actually doing a migration and you run across these things, somebody has to actually figure it out. And that is the part that is um, often a challenge because that configuration, it works very well right now. Well, if we cut out these pieces that we don't understand, is it gonna continue to work? And a lot of times the people that put this infrastructure in place initially may not even be with the company anymore. They may have moved on. Um, and, and if they have, then, then finding information about why things are done is very difficult. So one of the other unexpected benefits is that your configurations may actually become simpler. You may discover that those extra you know, tests that you were doing to specifically hand back this option to that server well, that's not even needed anymore. So you may discover that, that you're able to clean up and, uh, and put things in place that are much more easy to maintain. And then obviously, one of the things that you're gonna end up with, hopefully, is that your documentation is gonna end up documented. I did put the word may end up documented here because, well, I, I know people and uh, people are, are really good at, at uh, planning documentation. Well, we're gonna write all this down. We're gonna keep a log book. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And then about the 30th day into the process, everybody's kind of burned out and the documentation may not end up as, as good as you hope it does. But do keep your, uh, you know, keep your head up that uh, configuration. Uh, the documentation is really important. And it's not only important to you as you do the migration, but it's gonna be important to whoever ends up maintaining uh, your uh, configuration and maintaining your network uh, following. Uh, estimating the time, or actually estimating the effort required uh, to do a migration is something that, that I have never been able to come up with a good answer for. Um, what I have discovered is that project managers aren't evil, and not, not always. I, I, you know, I love project managers when they kind of help me out, but then when they put me on a task and make me do it, that's, I, you know, I'm not so happy about that. But I will tell you that when you're doing a migration, the project manager who is able to work with all of the different stakeholders is very, very, very useful. Uh, somebody that's able to say, okay, we're doing this migration, we're doing this change in this foreign country on this specific day, and we need to have all of these people aware of it, and we know the business requirements of whoever's equipment we're migrating so that we don't step on toes. Uh, the worst thing you can possibly do is do a migration when um, you know, the people that are actually at that site aren't expecting it. That's a bad thing. The effort required and the time required to do a migration are definitely not the same thing. The effort required is going to be uh, laid out from uh, you know, a very early date when you're planning the migration, when you're getting it set up, you know, here's how we're gonna configure everything. Here's how we're going to deal with um, uh, you know, communication within the organization. Here's how we're actually gonna do the technology piece. You know, how are we gonna change our lease times? How are we going to make all of these changes? And then of course the time required is not only the time for the preparation, but also the time for the cutovers. And when you're doing a migration from, you know, or within an organization and you want to do um, a little bit at a time, which I highly recommend, you don't wanna necessarily walk in and say, you know, we're gonna do, you know, 200,000 machines across, uh, you know, six time zones and, uh, uh, you know, four different languages, and we're going to do this all in a 12-hour period, and it's going to be, you know, this day. That's really going to be very difficult to, uh, to make happen. 
So I highly recommend several small to mid-sized migrations over a planned period uh, being much better than one large migration. Um, make sure that it is a planned period. Make sure that you have a beginning and an ending date of the entire migration. And make sure that one of those project managers that I mentioned earlier, make sure that they are actually keeping it on task. Uh, I've seen uh, places where a migration begins, they get partially into it, and then because of miscommunication or poor planning or poor timing, it ends up getting pushed off, and then it gets end up getting pushed off again and again, and it really falls down and doesn't, it, it isn't important anymore. So very important to make sure that you do stay on plan um, in a specific time period. Infrastructure that you have that is working now tends to remain working. So infrastructure at rest tends to remain at rest. Why do you want to do a migration? What are the needs? And when should you actually do this? Well, yes, you know, some software comes to an end as to its, uh, the, the date that it's being supported. Some uh, new software comes along that provides better uh, functionality, better, uh, better pieces. But you need, to, you need to measure this and it need, the decision needs to be made not only from the engineering perspective, but also from the management perspective to make sure that everybody is on board with this. Obviously, if you're doing a major infrastructure change, if you're going in and you're ripping out uh, large portions of your infrastructure and rebuilding them, then that is a fantastic time to migrate. Because then, you know, everybody's pointing their finger at somebody else that whose fault it is. And so it's, no, that's not why you do it. The reason that you do it when you're doing an infrastructure change is because you do have outage periods planned. You have times that people are, are aware that there are going to be uh, possibly poor service, broken service, and you're able to work into that plan. If you have a new campus, a new facility, or, or remote offices being added to your network, it might be a good time to try uh, a migration to the new software or new, uh, new uh, yeah, the new software in this case, the new services, um, maybe using those as a test location. You know, use that new campus as your test bed and as your initial deployment for Kia, and then seeing how it works and seeing how the configuration works, then use the tools that I'm gonna talk about later to roll back in your uh, in, into your existing infrastructure. Um, obviously, the end of life of existing infrastructure tools. Um, if you have you know software that's going out of date, that uh, is no longer being supported, is no longer getting those critical fixes that you need, then it may very well be time for you to move on and migrate to a uh, to a new uh, uh, infrastructure. And of course, if you have hundreds of available hours uh, with your, uh, your technology team and you have tens of thousands of leftover budget dollars, then hey, the migration, it's just any time you pick the time and throw those hours and throw that money at it and all is good with the world. So how do you go about doing a migration? Well, the first thing you need to do is document and review your existing configuration. As I said before, you know, there are surprises that are going to occur both within your network and within your existing configuration of your software. Um, one of the things to think about uh, at, at this point is, is it possible to consolidate your infrastructure? You know, can you, can you lessen the number of servers um, and, you know, add in some maybe high availability or, you know, some, some other types of hardening? Or would it possibly be beneficial to actually distribute functionality? Uh, one of the things that I've seen recently and that absolutely astonishes me, I, I wouldn't really have thought this to be a, uh, a viable option, but obviously people have done research and think that it is, is to move some of their DHCP services out to the cloud. Um, if you run your DHCP server um, out there somewhere and you have VPNs or whatever configured in such a way that um, you know your servers are or your clients are all able to get to those cloud-based servers that's fantastic um, i am much more of a distributed person where i would like to have the dhcp servers uh, as close to the clients as possible but obviously not in you know very very small offices 
Uh, Kia deployment options. Uh, there, are, there are some things that are different between ISC DHCP and Kia that you need to go in and, and look at and consider how these options can work best in your organization. One of the things that Kia comes with that ISC DHCP did not is a number of different options for database backends. And I'll discuss these a little bit, uh, a little bit later in the talk. One of the things that, that Kia has is high availability. And this might be one of the times that if you do not have IPv6 deployed, then this might be a really good time to do it because here is one of the pieces of your infrastructure that is going to assist in the deployment, you know, get it out there and, and make, uh, make your IPv6 infrastructure functional. Obviously, you're going to need to translate your configuration. You have an existing ISC DHCP configuration and you need to make it into a Kia configuration. There is a tool from ISC that is available uh, called Kia Ma, and that is a, the tool that I'll actually be talking about uh, in depth in, uh, in just a bit. You may want to go in and translate or rewrite your configuration by hand. Um, I, you know, depending on how complex your configuration is, that might be necessary. Um, if you have a very simple configuration, it may also be easier just to write a, you know, 25 line Kia configuration and deploy that instead of worrying about a, a tool to, uh, to make all of this happen. Obviously, you're going to need to test the translated configuration. Testing in a lab environment is, is absolutely required. Uh, don't even think about, well, I, you can think about it, but I would highly recommend against pushing Kia or any change uh, of this type into a uh, production environment without having run it significantly in the lab. And when I say testing the configuration, don't just test the functionality. Okay, yes, we give IP addresses to these clients. Yes, we give you know, the correct options. Yes, when I pick up the IP phone, it still dials out. But one of the things you really need to concern yourself with, with Kia, because it is a major change, is your performance. Um, I'll mention, I already mentioned the fact that you can use database backends. Well, just because you can use a database backend doesn't mean you necessarily want to use a database or should use a database backend. Find out if it's actually a, a necessity um, yes, it's cool, and yes, it's pretty awesome, but it might actually introduce some penalties in your performance that you're not aware of right off the bat. You know, when you're doing five or six uh, uh, IP address, you know, you're giving out five or six addresses a second, then you're not really pounding against the database, but when you put it out into production and you're doing thousands of, uh, of transactions, then you're, you're putting some stresses on places that you may not be aware that stresses are being put. Um, you're gonna need to migrate the leases. Um, at this point, and I'll mention this later, there is not a tool to translate the ISC DHCP leases file to uh, the Kia uh, infrastructure. That is something that is being considered, it's being contemplated, it's being thought about, but at this moment, there is not a tool uh, to make that happen. So at this point, your existing leases, uh, the leases uh, database is going to be rebuilt from scratch. Um, obviously, things that you need to think about here are the length of leases, uh, the machines that are the clients that are, that are actually going to be getting leases. Um, you know, make sure that you safeguard against uh, duplicate addresses being handed out, uh, something that's already in use. Um, and obviously, all of this depends on your client's resilience and the amount of traffic that you have, you know, how often uh, renewals are occurring. Uh, the quicker that the renewal occurs, you know, the, the less of a, of a hard impact that you're gonna see, but it's still gonna be a flurry of IP address changes um, as, as the uh, migration occurs. Uh, obviously, then you need to perform the cutover. Do it, again, my recommendation is do it little bits at a time, and obviously do it off hours. And just because I'm in, uh, you know, on, on the eastern coast of the U.S. doesn't mean that at 8 o'clock p.m. my time is going to be a good time to do the cutover of that remote office, um, you know, in the Far East. 
So obviously make sure that the hours that you're keeping are the hours that actually match up with, um, uh, with the, the clients that you're going to be uh, engaging. Now, some things to think about, uh, ISC DHCP versus Kia. Um, the, the failover uh, DHCP uh, uh, that is implemented in uh, ISC DHCP, it was never actually in a, a fully uh, authorized, a fully uh, agreed upon specification. It works um, and it, it works well, but it is not implemented in Kia. So if you are using failover in a classic ISC DHCP environment, that is not going to work um, in a, a directly in a Kia environment. You're going to need to do something different. And what is that different thing? Well, that different thing is going to be something along the lines of a high availability uh, cluster of two uh, Kia servers. Now, obviously this is not available in ISC DHCP, but it is one of the pieces that is available um, in the Kia servers. Uh, again, this is one of the things that you need to consider um, in your performance testing. Um, look at how the uh, uh, configuration of your high availability servers uh, impacts your infrastructure as to the number of leases that you're able to provide. And one of the things that I'm not going to get into a significant amount of detail here, but it is something you need to be aware of is that there is a difference in option inheritance between ISC DHCP and Kia. Uh, the scoping that is done within ISC DHCP and the way that the scoping is done within Kia is a little bit different. And so you need to make sure that when you have options that are inherited in, within ISC DHCP configurations, you need to make sure that those are being handled the same way in Kia. Um, it's going to be my uh, recommendation that um, uh, obviously that you do a, a good reading of the, uh, the Kia Administrator's Guide. Um, it's available, uh, you know, obviously through the IC uh, website, and uh, that would be a great place to uh, read over, make sure that, that the things are working the way you expect them to. Uh, some of the options that you need to think about uh, with Kia. Uh, there's a new uh, thing within the, the most recent, uh, actually, uh, oh, wow, uh, upcoming release of Kia. Uh, that is the configuration backend. And uh, what that's going to allow you to do is keep your Kia configurations within your database store. So you're going to be able to keep uh, configurations instead of on each server. Uh, you will be able to keep your configurations in a common place maintained by uh, some of your maybe uh, obviously new tools uh, that can be created to modify within the database. And then that will allow you to actually make changes within your Kia servers out in the field within you know, a maintained uh, database uh, structure. Um, host reservations, uh, obviously they were previously kept either in the leases file or in uh, the DHCP configuration. You now have an option of keeping those host reservations in a database backend. And what that will allow you to do, obviously, is maintain your reservations much more easily. You know, you don't have to go in and edit a file and restart a, a server. You're able to go in with your database tools, make changes in the database, and then have Kia recognize those changes and move forward with those reservations. Um, the lease database. Uh, was previously kept in a, a log file format uh, database with ISC DHCP. You know, the, the newest leases would just be written to the end of that file. The file would just continue to grow. It would be reread when the, the server uh, was uh, restarted. Kia uh, provides you with the ability to keep your leases. And this can be actually a different, this is a different database than your reservations. It allows you, if you want, to keep your lease database in, or your leases in a database. Um, maybe you already have a, a high-speed database. Maybe you already have a distributed database. You know, if you're, if you're running multiple Kia instances, uh, you, may be, uh, you may want to be able to keep uh, those databases all uh, coalesced within, a, uh, within one database. But the, the big issue that I have here is that do you actually have a need to keep the leases in a database. 
I fully understand host reservations being kept in a database, but things like leases, writing to a log file format, a uh, file is obviously very easy. Writing into a database is doing multiple transactions, it's locking databases, it's doing things behind the scenes that will slow down your ability to provide leases uh, to clients. So if you need that, if you need that, yes, it is available, but consider the ramifications before you, you know, build out your entire infrastructure thinking that you're going to have all your leases in a database and then discover that you're only getting, you know, a, 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 a fraction of the, uh, the leases uh, that you were uh, previously uh, getting. Uh, so now I will move on to the Kia Migration Assistant. And this is the, the piece that I'm sure that everybody is interested in because everybody's already done all of those planning pieces for their migration. They're all ready to just run this migration tool and have the right thing happen. And I would love to tell you that that's exactly the way it's gonna be, but listen to my slides first. Listen to me talk about it a little bit. So the Kia Migration Assistant is a branch of the legacy IS, ISC DHCP server. Um, it has been worked on by, uh, by some of the, the members of the ISC team. Uh, I, I think there was, there was uh, talk that it was absolutely impossible to, uh, to you know, write a, a piece of code that was gonna take an existing configuration and create a new configuration. Uh, one of our uh, engineers uh, said, okay, if that's fine, that's, that's impossible. Uh, went off over a weekend and came back and said, yeah, I finished, uh, you know, I, I have something that, that I think works pretty well and it has continued to uh, get better uh, from that point. So the input to the Kia Migration Assistant is your existing ISC DHCP configuration. And obviously it is in the, uh, the DHCP configuration language uh, that we're all familiar with, the one that if you mistype something, it may just appear as a variable and your configuration continues to run, awesome. And the output of this Migration Assistant is going to be the JSON Kia configuration that is very structured, has a very obvious uh, mechanism of, of being read and being parsed, and honestly is a, a significant step up from the, uh, the, uh, I, uh, the DHCP uh, configuration language in, in my experience. When you run the Kia uh, Migration Assistant, if you are running both IPv6 and IPv4 um, uh, DHCP uh, services, you actually will run the uh, migration assistant twice. You'll run it once for the IPv6 and once for the IPv4 because Kia actually uses two separate configuration files um, and this will produce a, uh, a separate uh, file per protocol. So you'll then have an IPv4 configuration for Kia and an IPv6 configuration for Kia. Um, the migration assistant is aware of things that exist in your ISC DHCP configuration that cannot be, for whatever reason, translated into a Kia uh, statement. And so what uh, the uh, migration assistant does is it actually uh, produces a message in the new configuration that is a, uh, a, you know, a, a, just a note as to why it isn't, you know, it wasn't translated. It's, it's very obvious that it didn't occur. It also produces a link to the ISC uh, GitLab, the Kia uh, uh, information about that specific problem or reason for uh, not being able to be translated. I'll show you a couple of samples of these. This is fantastic because if you run across something in your configuration, you are provided with a link to some documentation or to a, an issue that, uh, the, that ISC said, you know, this, we haven't seen many people using this. It's not, you know, we, we see it's used to, you know, there's a different specification that, that does it a different way. You're able to go in and see that information. You're able to look at that GitLab um, issue and see if you agree or disagree. And then since we are open source. And since that GitLab is available for you to provide input, if you disagree or if you want to see that feature or functionality added, you can do that directly in GitLab. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, conversion of lease files is not currently supported. 
Uh, so what that's going to mean for you is that existing leases are not going to be able to be brought over directly. They, uh, you know, you can put, uh, you know, host reservations in your, uh, in your uh, configuration file, but anything that was provided through a, the lease, normal lease mechanism uh, through ISC DHCP will not come across to Kia. We can't at this moment. Uh, the other thing that this does is any host reservations that were either created manually in the leases file or were created by OMAPI are also not going to come across. So this is something that, that you need to be aware of. You know, when, when, and I'm expecting this is a when, not an if, uh, but you know, when the tool comes around that, that is able to read the leases file and create the databases, um, both for reservations and for leases, that's gonna be something that, that uh, will probably assist uh, a lot of people. So again, additional tools are under consideration. Uh, we do not have them in the, uh, the timeline right now, but uh, you know, the roadmap is something that is changing. Uh, so if you feel that this is a need and you are, you know, please, please make, your, make your voices heard. So how do you go about using, how do you go about getting and using this, uh, this uh, uh, Kiyama uh, code? Well, it is in a Git repo. Uh, off, uh, it's a branch off of the existing uh, ISC DHCP code and the branch name is Migration Assistant. So uh, if you uh, want to go out and find it, it is uh, at this URL, obviously GitLab, isc.org. It's one of our projects, it's the DHCP. And this is actually to the, uh, the source code uh, uh, Git repo. There is a compile set of uh, compile and run instructions in a wiki. And this is gonna be much, uh, much easier for a lot of people to use. I'll, I'll tell you, I am not a, a Git wizard. And so if somebody provides me with a, a way of doing it through a shell script, then I'm gonna be much happier than, than trying to figure out how to uh, navigate through uh, GitLab. So if you go to the URL here, and uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll make these available uh, uh, shortly uh, after the, the presentation here, um, there is a, a document, and I will say thank you very much to the, uh, the Kia uh, engineering team uh, who were able to put this together on, on short notice. Um, it is a fantastic little document that literally comes down to a set of um, instructions that are pasted right here. Uh, you can copy and paste it into a shell window and it will go out, it'll get the migration assistant, it'll extract it, it will configure it. Now obviously it's configuring it here, you'll see right there in the middle, that uh, it just runs it with no configure options. There are a lot of options available. Um, if you wanna put it somewhere other than user local, then you wanna put it in a, you know, put in a dash dash prefix equals, and then the path to which uh, you want it installed. Um, CD into the directory, make, and then obviously uh, the make install uh, needs to be run as root. I hope you don't run installations as root. So uh, just be aware that, uh, it is going to write things into the path, uh, primarily user local and under. Once you have uh, Kiyama installed, uh, it does have a man page. So it's the Kia Migration Assistant. It gives you all of the options uh, that are available. Uh, it converts an ISC DHCP configuration file into the corresponding Kia configuration file. Uh, the interesting things here are uh, dash four for IPv4, dash six for IPv6, and then um, the dash in is going to move uh, the host reservations that are found in the configuration file into the matching subnet instead of having them at the global, the global scope. Um, there is an option here, you'll notice at the, the second line there under the synopsis, it says dash L and then the hooks library path. Um, that is actually used uh, to find, to tell uh, the, the uh, migration assistant where your Kia hooks are. Um, and actually at this time, it is really used only to uh, provide a path for the hooks library in the configuration file. Um, if you do not specify uh, the dash L and then the, the path, and you use something that is a, that would require a hook, 
it will put that into the configuration file, but it will not, uh, you know, it'll be as a comment. So you'll need to go in and obviously as you're editing, you're uh, checking the configuration, making sure that it actually does what you're expecting it to do. Uh, you'll be able to fix that path. So the easy sample here, you run uh, Kia MA, dash four, dash I for the input of dhcp.conf, dash O of kia.conf, and that's it, you're done. Everything is happy. You now have a Kia configuration file that you can run, it, but that's not really the way that uh, it works. Uh, well, I mean, that is the way it works, but you are going to have to go in and, and check and edit the configuration uh, quite a bit. So I have a small network example uh, that I'm gonna use to show you how, what the input and the output of uh, Kiyama are. Uh, so here we see a, a very simple uh, configuration for a, uh, a single subnet, uh, a single host, uh, it's a Roku television set. Uh, we see that it has a, uh, a, a fixed address, so it has a, a reservation. Uh, we see a single net mask with a single router a one, one range of IP addresses, and then we see a couple of, uh, of options that would not be uh, uh, surprising to see in, in any uh, network configuration. So at this point, I would run kia ma-4-i home.conf-o home.kia. So now I'm ending up with a file called home.kia, which should be a kia configuration file. So let's look at the output. The output that I'm provided is significantly more verbose. The input was 16 lines, the output is 70 lines. So yes, that is, uh, uh, and you'll see why uh, in a minute. It really isn't going to expand that much um, over a, a normal configuration. There are some issues that needed to be specified that we need to make changes or we need to be aware of in this configuration. And those are actually put into the output configuration file. So the output configuration file, this is the, the beginning of that file. And I actually highlighted in red, so it doesn't, it doesn't do the highlighting. So uh, this, was, this was just so that I could point out things much more easily. We see anything that has the three slashes in front of it is a comment. And in this case, we see that the uh, migration assistant put in a comment that says, this configuration uh, declares some subnets, but has no interfaces config and then it references Kia number uh, four, uh, 245. Well, with ISC DHCP, you would provide the interfaces on which DHCP was gonna listen on the command line. In Kia, that is now part of the configuration file. Since we didn't provide that information to the migration assistant, it had no way of telling us. And so we have this interfaces configuration comment. So what I can do now is I can go out to HTTPS, gitlab.isc.org, ISC Projects, Kia, and then look at issue number 245. And if I go to that link, what I will discover is there is the ISC DHCP users specify interfaces on the command line. There is a real risk when converting an ISC DHCP server config to Kia to end up with a config without interfaces. Note to add wildcard interfaces does not really help. As it is a difference in models, there is nothing which can be done other than to be aware. So there is not anything that the migration assistant can do other than warn you that this is uh, something that you're going to need to deal with on your own. So you will need to go in and as specified in the uh, Kia uh, administrator's manual, you're gonna to need to specify the interfaces on which Kia is going to be listening. So that's our first little issue that we run into. Uh, we run into a second issue. Again, you'll see the two slashes and we see the, uh, a portion of the configuration here. And the comment says, max lease time not, is not supported. Use default lease time instead. Reference Kia number 221. Well, I know that a lot of people that run networks that have uh, random, I know it's not necessarily random, but, but clients that are not under your control, um, they, they have a default lease time, but they don't necessarily, or but, but they allow you 
at, at your client to specify a longer or shorter lease time. Well, Kia doesn't have the concept at this moment, it is one of the things that is in progress, um, of the minimum and maximum lease times. So again, we can go out and look at the GitLab, uh, ISC Projects, Kia, look at issue number 221. And what we find there is that ISC DHCP uses three values, the maximum, minimum, and the default uh, values for lease time, which in Kia is the valid lease time. Uh, these three values are in the Kia code, but they were not at this point reflected in the configuration. So they were there, but you couldn't actually set them in configuration. Um, as the valid lifetime is a mandatory configuration parameter, this means that Kia is rigid in its configuration. And again, this was the an, an initial uh, comment that was put into the GitLab so that we could refer back to it to see why this appeared in our uh, Kia configuration. Uh, there's some other information in that, same, uh, in that same issue regarding some other timers. So preferred lifetime, uh, T1 and T2 are uh, created within ISC DHCP uh, using a standard formula. And so that is documented here, but is not necessarily, we're not, we're not worried about that with our specific issue. Um, so if that helped you, that's awesome. Um, if you are happy with going, okay, well, we don't need, now we can just say all of the leases that we give out are going to have this one time, and we're not going to worry about uh, providing, um, you know, the, the minimum and maximum, so we're just going to fix everybody at one lease time, then that's fantastic. However, I know that there are a lot of organizations out there that either have this configuration uh, just from, from history, they think that it's a requirement, maybe it is a requirement. So again, being in GitLab, when you go to that ticket or go to that issue, you're now able to express your own opinion. And this was my opinion. Uh, the use of max lease time and min lease times in addition to default lease time is very common in existing customer configurations for ISC DHCP. Kia at this point does not support these options. On behalf of customers, I'd like to request that these options be supported or that a document be produced explaining how to get the same effect with the available options. And from this and from discussion, um, it has been uh, agreed that these are uh, going to be implemented um, at a point in the future. So this is something that, again, if you need it right now, then a migration may not necessarily be uh, in your future at this moment. But again, minimum and maximum lease times, you have a set lease time that's pretty much what you should, you know, it, it, it works. It, again, depends on your uh, requirements. Uh, so here is some other, uh, oh, so the, the rest of my, the, uh, the little configuration, um, we are authoritative. Here are my subnets. Uh, the ID of the first subnet is ID 1. Um, it is that slash 24. The pool was created from the, uh, the range that I had specified in the configuration. And then uh, we see the options that are provided to servers within that uh, pool. Uh, we see the router um, and it is the information that was provided from the, uh, the ISC DHCP configuration. Uh, we then see um, a reservation. So I had that one global reservation for the host name of Roku uh, that, well, it was, it was named Roku. Uh, the hardware address was specified in the ISC DHCP configuration. And then here are the options that are sent to that specific uh, client when it uh, requests an address. And here is the address that is given to that client. So here we see a global reservation, again, not stored in a database, but stored in the Kia configuration. And it was pulled directly from the ISC DHCP configuration. So this configuration migrated relatively well. Um, what did not migrate was documented very well. I was able to figure out what pieces I needed to add um, and, and you know, make sure that it continued to function the way I expected it to. The big caveat here is that this was an extremely simple configuration. I doubt that anybody on this call 
has anything in production that was as simplistic as, as this. Um, I actually don't either. Um, I removed a number of, uh, of uh, dynamic uh, DNS configurations um, and other things just to be able to cut down on the complexity. Uh, but this is a sample of what will uh, be produced. Um, over the next couple of slides, I'm going to provide a, uh, a couple of snippets uh, with some uh, more complex issues. Um, so if you use OMAPI in your DHCP, uh, ISC DHCP configuration, you probably have an OMAPI port number and then you include a key from somewhere or you have a key uh, in the uh, configuration. Well, OMAPI doesn't exist with Kia. You have other uh, abilities to make changes to the Kia configuration to the uh, leases, but OMAPI is not one of them. So here we see that OMAPI port is an internal ISC DHCP feature and it is commented out. There is no uh, uh, resource for this within Kia. Uh, the delayed ACK parameter. So we had a delayed ACK set of 28. Well, delayed ACK isn't supported in Kia. So again, the Kia configuration has the information, but it is not actually in the, uh, it's, it's not supported. So it's there so that you're aware that it, this is what would be here if this was something that, that Kia actually did at this point, but it is not. Um, update optimization, uh, that is actually handled uh, by RFC 4702 semantics now. So update optimization is, again, not a supported feature. When you run your configurations through uh, uh, Kia, uh, Kia Ma, you are going to see the bits and pieces that you're going to need to change. And again, it may be because the way things were done in the past was not the best way to go about doing them. It was not standards-based. And so we're now doing things more standard. Um, so one of, one of the most interesting things that I've seen uh, with Kiyama is where you have some programmatic um, constructs uh, within ISC DHCP. Uh, so you see, you know, if you have a substring within the option of DHCP client identifier uh, between the first and the fourth characters of RAS space, then we're going to ignore booting. Well, that is something that can be done with Kia, but it's not handled very well by the migration assistant. Because when you have that, those three lines, what you end up with is this output. So we see that it's a statement if condition equals left subspring expression option within the DHCP universe of this option within, from the first to the fourth with the RAS, then we're gonna ignore uh, the allow, and well, we're gonna ignore uh, yeah, okay, we're going to ignore, uh, we're going to dis, bleh. we're going to disallow booting. So this is something that you're going to need to go through in the, uh, uh, the Kia uh, uh, manual in the administrator's guide and look at the way that you're actually going to need to do this within your configuration. So we see that that code was output the, the way that the structure was dealt with within ISC DHCP, but this is not going to be something that Kia is going to read uh, directly. So other things, we've already talked about OMAPI, the delayed ACK. Uh, DDNS TTL uh, is a D2 uh, not yet supported feature. And again, we have Kia references uh, 225, uh, the update optimization I spoke about, uh, reverse updates. Notice in this case, the comment is Kia model is equivalent, but different. This does not have a specific Kia issue associated with it, but it is documented in the uh, Kia uh, manual. Uh, the server ID check is not yet supported. Again, we have a reference number. Ping check is not supported. Update static leases is obsolete. Uh, min and max lease times are not supported. And as you go into more complex configurations, you will see other bits that are significantly different in the way that ISC DHCP uh, implemented them and the way that Kia, that Kia implements them. And it'll be documented, but it will be something that you're going to need to manually go in and configure. So I've talked a lot. I see that it's about nine minutes until I'm supposed to stop talking, but if we include the comments, I should already be stopped. 
Um, the migration to Kiev may or may not make sense for you at this time. I'm not supposed to go into, you know, oh, you don't need to do Kia, but need to make some really, really important decisions at this point. Please be aware of the changes that are going to occur within your environment. Plan far in advance, plan ahead. Migration is a large undertaking, even in a small environment. Uh, Kiama is available from the ISC Git repo, and the how-to is in the wiki. So I would strongly recommend playing with Kia. I love Kia. It is, it is fantastic. The ability to do things with database backends for the configuration, uh, the database backend for the ability uh, for your reservations is awesome. Leases. I'm still not sure that your leases database needs to go in or leases file uh, or your leases need to go into a database, but that is something that is available to you. And so with that, I'm going to get out of my presentation so that I can see the uh, questions and answers and things that are being asked here. So I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to open the chat window. Uh, Vicki, do you want to go from here? Yeah, we have um, we have uh, been in the background, been uh, sort of starting to answer some of these questions. Um, the first one in here um, from uh, Stuart uh, Provost. Uh, um, we have a network networks.conf file that has thousands of include files, one line per DHCP conf file. Uh, does Kia MA support converting multiple conf files? And I believe we have an answer here. Uh, Thomas, I unmuted you if you want to actually speak or... Uh... Oh, you did? I now wasn't listening. Yeah. <laughs> this is the what? question about uh, the Kia Migration Assistant, um, how you use, a, use it to translate a, a DHCP configuration that has lots and lots of include files. It should just do it. I, I, I didn't write him, uh, but I, re I just ran a, a little test. I saw it has unit tests that verify that I can do it. And I actually ran a test with a couple of small configs that I have, one, in it, one that includes the other, and it, it does do it. So it should, just, it should just automatically read them all in just as though, um, just, just as the, uh, the same as ISC DHCP would do. So thousands of include files is a bigger thing than we have tested with. Uh, I think you probably noticed that in the answer. So uh, there's no guarantees, but uh, it looks like you may be in luck there. Um, uh, someone else um, uh, typed in uh, Samuel, uh, and I won't try to say his last name, typed in uh, a whole series of questions. I answered a few of them. Um, but not all of them. Uh, one, um, it looks like Zoom only lets you type so much in an answer and then it cuts you off. Uh, his third question, some of these are just general um, Kia questions, is uh, does Kia support option 82 and logging? We would like to log a subscriber based on the option 82 and possibly MAC address. So a couple ways you could take that question. Uh, I think the first question is, does the log, um, by default, um, include, and by this I think he means the lease file, uh, the option 82 and the MAC address. And I will leave that. I see people on here that are very much more uh, uh, authoritative on this than I am. Uh, so if we do have any member of the ISC, or of the, uh, the Kia engineering team that would like to feel that, I would be more than happy to allow you to do that. Whoops, sorry. Gowski, so I can, I can take uh, this one. Uh, so, <clears throat> of course, Kia supports uh, option 82. Uh, you can use it in uh, several ways. The first one is uh, you, you can use it in client classification if you want to, to do something based on this, like uh, segregate clients to, to different subnets or different pools. Uh, you can also use uh, a different feature called Flex ID where uh, you can identify clients uh, not by MAC address, but uh, by whatever uh, you want. You can define an expression, and in that expression, for example, you can say that you, you are interested in option 82, sub option 1, or a substring of that option. And finally, we have uh, 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 yet another feature called uh, forensic logging, which is designed specifically to log to uh, 
to uh, to a file to to, to provide uh, forensic information. Uh, which device uh, got uh, which IP address uh, with specific dates and we provide as much information as possible and uh, that includes uh, logging uh, sub options from option 82. So maybe you could um, go on there's, uh, and look at the next uh, question um, from the same uh, person. Is there a recommended server build environment uh, and I think this is for Kia as a whole, not for the migration assistant. Okay, and I apologize. Uh, it, when when the moderator uh, mutes you and you uh, uh, or get you get unmuted, you can talk a little bit, and then if you mute yourself again, you lose the ability to unmute yourself. So I apologize oh, for that. Okay. Um, so that may uh, have occurred to Thomas and Tomek as well. Right. Tomek. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's go through the the next question. There was. Uh, is the uh, Kiyama run on the actual DHCP server to generate equivalent uh, JSON context? Uh, you can do this, but you don't have to. Uh, basically, the only thing you need are the, the input uh, config files. So, and you can run them on your production server or uh, on any Linux or Unix machine. So, so okay. I think, I think it's it's also if I can just add, um, this is intended as an offline utility, um, it's not something that you need to run on an ongoing basis. Uh, so, the safest thing would probably be to uh, you know transfer your configs to another machine and run the utility. <clears throat> it it is um, yeah, it's an offline uh, uh, utility really. So the next question, question five, about the recommended environment. Um, you want to say something about that? I can look up the uh, KB article on performance, and I'll, I'll post the link in the chat while you're talking. <clears throat> OK. So there's, uh, so right now, Kia is uh, single threaded. So if, if you want to, to deploy an uh, existing version, Kia 1.5 or the upcoming one, 1.6, uh, you probably want uh, a CPU with the highest uh, CPU clock. However, the, the next one after, uh, after that, 1.7, it will be multi-threaded. So it will then get uh, the benefit of uh, having uh, multiple cores. Uh, with uh, CPU, uh, the Kia is CPU bound if you are using a MEM file, which is the equivalent of uh, uh, of using plain uh, list file. Uh, so in that case, if you want to do it, do it uh, having fast uh, CPU is uh, important. Regarding RAM, uh, there's really not, uh, not that much RAM being used. I mean, you know, the standard 16 gigabytes is now. Uh, there is a huge uh, performance gain uh, to be made uh, if you are uh, running your database locally and if you are doing this on SSD disks. So, but you know, there is no like one specific hardware recommendation. The general rule applies, the faster, the better. Sorry, I muted myself too. Um, uh, let's see, so the next question, um, with the restriction, with the lease files, does that mean that there might be potential IP address given to new clients? I'm not completely sure. I think that this is, uh, maybe, I'm not sure what the question means. Um, so the, the, the question here, I'm pretty sure, is the fact that if you're switching over from one DHCP server to another and you don't bring the leases file over, the new DHCP server doesn't know the existing leases that are already in place, the, the clients that have already received addresses. And so, yes, there is the possibility that you will give out addresses that are already in use, 
but there should be um, obviously a very short lease time um, and uh, during during your transition uh, from ISC DHCP to, to Kia or basically for any infrastructure change like this. And uh, in that case, um, the uh, existing leases uh, would be, uh, the, 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 the overlap is gonna be very small. Um, hopefully it would not, uh, not, not be greatly impacted. Okay, we have another question that is probably best answered by Tamek. Um, also from Stuart Provost, do you have or know of any test tools that generate random DHCP client interaction so we can test the performance of Kia? Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a tool called uh, Perf DHCP. Uh, it's uh, not perfect, it's, uh, but it, it's able to, to simulate uh, thousands of uh, clients. <laughs> so there are two ways how, how it can be run. The first one is uh, when you specify uh, uh, that, that, you want to, uh, that you want the tool to, to generate specific number of packets per second. And then you see what happens, whether your server is able to cope, cope up with it and it will give you the information that uh, uh, how, how many leases were assigned, uh, whether uh, the, the responses uh, uh, appeared to within a second or not, <coughs> and uh, how many of them were dropped and so on. And the second mode is uh, that, uh, uh, well, in this mode, uh, there are no retransmissions. So, each client tries only once, and if it's not uh, uh, provisioned in time, uh, it's just uh, counted as uh, as packet not, not being received. Uh, the, the second mode is more, uh, I would say, realistic. So you, you specify the number of uh, devices that should be simulated uh, with all the retransmissions. So if, if the response is not coming back within a second, uh, the client uh, starts retransmitting. So and this way, uh, you can measure the server performance in a different way. Let's say you reboot your CMTS and you have thousand uh, cable modems and, and you, you want to measure how long it takes to provision all of them. So, and uh, both, both of them, uh, 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 both of those capabilities uh, will be available in upcoming Kia 1.6. The first mode is already available in the older versions. Okay, um, so I am also uh, keying in on this one comment, random DHCP client interaction in the question. And um, I think uh, this may be obvious, but um, you know, this tool is, uh, is not really creating random interactions. And the reality is there's no substitute for real clients, particularly if your concern is about, uh, you know, clients that may have a non-optimal uh, behavior. Um, uh, so that is, uh, that's always probably an unknown on a large network. Um, so there's another question again, really for Tomek, um, what's the ETA on Kia 1.7? You might start by just recapping the Kia 1.6 uh, schedule. Yeah, okay, so uh, right now we are working on 1.6, <laughs> so beta is expected next, next week. Final is expected by uh, end of July. And after that, we'll start working on 1.7. This is uh, this is the one that will be focused on performance and will provide uh, uh, multi-threading. We don't have any specific dates, but uh, we are aiming for uh, winter 2019. So it's, you know, like, I don't want to give specific dates right now, but think maybe November, maybe December. Okay, uh, Luke is asking, what are the options when scaling in a cluster uh, for more than two servers? Um. Well, so I'm gonna ask the question, uh, Luke, if you can, if you can uh, respond back in the Q&A there. Um, what would be your use? Are you, are you talking about um, like one Kia or two or more Kia servers uh, providing leases for uh, the same set of pools? Or are you uh, looking for, um, well, it, basically the answer is two servers are what HA is about. And you can obviously use the uh, database backend to share 
you know, leases files and, and reservations across multiple servers. Uh, but we do not at this point have any option for clustering uh, for, for that definition of clustering for more than two. So Luke, if you want to add any, any uh, follow-up in there, um, you know, we can address that or. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, while uh, Luke's typing, I also want to mention something that uh, we are working on right now, which is uh, config backend. So, so this is an upcoming uh, feature in 1.6. So this will allow, uh, allow you to store uh, major parts of the configuration so that means uh, shared networks, uh, subnets, uh, uh, pools, uh, options, uh, and option definitions in a database. And then you could <laughs> configure multiple key instances to uh, connect to the database and use this uh, configuration. So depending on uh, uh, what, what do you mean uh, by more than two servers, uh, this might be a viable option for you or not, depending on what exactly you want to achieve. So Luke, you don't have to type. Uh, I've just enabled you to talk, so you can just. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, I think it's just really to understand a bit. So, typically, our, our, our user case is that um, uh, we have a, a couple of um, addresses that um, we use to, to for, for all of the um, you know, for the leases to come across, and that's where they're they're directed. So this is the actual DHCP requests. And then it's really, you know, we have all of our pools on the servers. And obviously, if you're going to hit, you know, any of the servers, then you need to have, you know, any of the pools on there. So I think it's really how you do that in a scalable way. I sort of get the, the database method where you start to extrapolate the, the leases away and the, the config. But I think it was whether there was any other options there. So I think it's large scale of of um, clients basically hitting the servers and then being able to go to any of the of the um, of the servers to get its lease if that still makes sense I think that we may be better off uh, following up with this um through an email because I, 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 I'm not, I, I grasp it, but I'm not sure that I have a good answer at this moment. Mm. So my understanding is that uh, the solution you are looking for is like uh, uh, any cast DHCP server, something like that. So you have some way of uh, getting the traffic to any of the servers and you don't really care which ones. So <laughs> I think that's pretty much right. Any cast is a method of getting there, absolutely. But any sort of load balancing where you just pick any of the servers and you know you're going to get a response back. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we don't have any ready solution for that, uh, but uh, there are deployments that are using Kia in this way. Uh, so it's, it's possible to do it. Uh, it's just that uh, you need to... Uh, to figure out uh, some parts uh, uh, on your own. Uh, just uh, there is no simple configuration in Kia that, that you can use it out of the box. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, one of the issues is that um, if you have multiple Kia servers sharing the same uh, address space, able to give out uh, the you know addresses from the same pool, you can have uh, multiple Kia servers trying to assign the same address, so there can be contention. And whichever one managed to write the lease first basically wins, and the other one has to go back for another address. In an environment that doesn't have a, um, uh, a very high uh, uh, demand for rapid you know, leases, this may not be much of a problem. Obviously, if you have a, um, a much busier environment, you know, uh, a planning for contention like that is a bigger uh, issue. So is this where people more use database backends then? So that and that's where they store the leases or to get the scale or? So 
sorry, I, I just muted because I have a lot of barking in the background. Um, uh, the issue is the same whether you're using a database, uh, it, you know, if you're using, if you're using a database, that's where you would be sharing the back end. So, um, having the, having the leases in a database doesn't eliminate uh, contention if you're uh, assigning, sure. you have multiple servers assigning addresses from the same pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to stress out if you connect multiple Kia servers to a single shared database, uh, each Kia instance uh, will understand that it lost an array, so it, it will never assign the same address to, uh, to, uh, to a different uh, uh, client. So Kia first uh, looks whether the uh, IP address is available when it is, then it tries to insert a lease. But if the insertion fails, that means that it lost the, the race and needs to pick a different address. So it might be inefficient if there are lots of contentions, but uh, it will still be safe. Okay, understood. Great, thank you. Uh, so we're, we're over time. I think the last question that we should probably answer for everyone is, um, uh, uh, there were a couple of questions about how long will we continue to support ISC DHCP? And Tomek, if you wouldn't mind taking that because I have some background noise. Uh, okay, so that's a tricky one. <laughs> so in general, uh, we don't have any specific firm date set. Uh, so we, we want to encourage the community to, to migrate to Kia. And uh, we'll, uh, we, uh, our long-term plan is to basically decrease ISC involvement in the project to make it more community-driven. Uh, but there won't be any specific date when we say, okay, we are pulling the plug and the, the code disappears from the internet. So, so that, that's uh, not going to happen. As for uh, our involvement in the, in the project, uh, we are thinking that sometime around uh, 2020 might be a good time to, you know, to start uh, decreasing uh, any activities. But uh, in a sense, this is something that's been already happening for a while. Uh, when there are people coming to us and asking for new features in ICDHCP, usually we say that, no, sorry, we are not implementing any, 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 anything new that is a major feature. We do some small bug fixes and uh, some improvements uh, for, for customers, but overall, uh, the great majority of the <laughs> DHCP team is now focused on, on Kia. Yeah, so uh, just to be clear, we are still supporting ISC DHCP. We're still fixing bugs. We are still evaluating any reported security issues. Um, we just know that with the in a really, really large install base of ISC DHCP, we need to give people a lot of advance notice and a lot of, uh, you know, advance uh, indication. Um, uh, that they need to start considering migration. It's not going to be something that people are going to be able to do overnight. So, um, you know, um, we have made a commitment to support it through the end of 2020. At that, at that point, you know, uh, we'll see how much longer we can continue supporting it. As, as Tomek mentioned, the main issue is that there, we have a limited ability to add a lot of new features. And we do get new feature requests all the time. And it is rare that, um, you know, we agree to add new features to ISC DHCP. But um, we are still uh, fixing bugs and maintaining it. And uh, we are committed to doing that through the end of 2020. But um, we can see that the light at the end of the tunnel for ISC DHCP. So, um, you know, we want people to start thinking about a migration. That's why we're coming up with this tool. And, um, you know, we welcome you uh, to share your experience with us as you migrate. There are uh, uh, plenty of people on the Kia users list um, who have migrated from ISC DHCP. Um, you know, there may be uh, uh, some, some good help from other Kia users there as well. With that, I, we are uh, 16 minutes over time and it looks like we've come to the end of the questions. So uh, I think, oops. Uh, 
Here's another question about a support contract from Stuart. Stuart, I think we'll just address that privately if that's okay, uh, because most of the folks on the, on the webinar are not uh, support customers. Um, uh, of course, we will help our support customers uh, migrate to Kia. Um, uh, I will be uh, posting a recording and also posting the slides on the ISC website uh, that should happen uh, later today, certainly by tomorrow. So uh, thank you to uh, Alan, as well as the other folks on the Kia team who helped to answer questions. And thanks to all of you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.